probably for every visual problem, we've got 10 auditory problems. And unfortunately, most of the auditory problems are never identified. I think the biggest problem we have in American education today are problems that are reflections of auditory issues. And we almost have an epidemic of them. The primary cause of most of the auditory issues is a little thing called fluid in the middle ear or otis media. Okay. Huge, huge numbers of kids have chronic fluid in the middle ear, particularly from birth up to about uh, six or seven years. Virtually never is it identified. Your pediatrician typically will go in and check ears looking for ear infections. The pediatrician typically will not do the test necessary to identify fluid problems. Even to the point your child may have an ear infection, they'll put them on antibiotics, look in and the ear infection's gone, and they say, we're fine. Well, you can have, and generally do have fluid issues without infection. The brain has to learn how to process specific frequencies of sound. Most of that processing occurs in the first two years of life. That processing is very, very frequency specific. All right, it is so frequency specific that the reason most of us have difficulty ever learning a foreign language or learning how to speak it well without an accent is we literally cannot hear them. And we can't hear them because different languages emphasize different frequencies of sound. And in your first few years of life, if you haven't been exposed to those frequencies, your brain doesn't learn how to process those frequencies. The most glaring example is in Japanese, there's no R sound. And you can bring in a whole bunch of native Japanese and line them up and have them all say rice and they all say lice. And you can do it every day for the next year and they're still going to be saying lice. Because they literally cannot hear that sound. Okay. The human ear processes sounds <clears throat> from 20 hertz to 20,000. Okay? And if you go get a hearing test, they will test six or eight frequencies out of 20,000, okay? Guess how good that is, all right? I mean, it'll tell you if you're deaf or close to it, all right, but it really cannot tell you how well your child hears. Yes, ma'am? Got a question on this then. I, um, I have a six-month-old, and I live in a two-language home. My husband is Asian, and his mother-in-law is living with us, and so my daughter hears English, and my husband's language all day long. Is that going to make her hearing, from what I'm hearing from you, is that going to make her hear more frequencies? <coughs> it is. Someone that, so in that way, perception is good. That's good. Okay. Because we often wonder if this is okay that my daughter's hearing both of these languages, but my mother-in-law does not speak English very well. So she's with my daughter all day long, and then my husband and I are with her the rest of the time, and so we want to know if this is really okay. Yeah, just so you know, typically in a bilingual or trilingual home, uh, language is a little delayed generally for the first three years, but after three years, everything kicks in and you're off and running with two or three languages. Okay. So it's, it's a good thing. All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah, actually what we do, you know, with young children who we want to, you know, really put their pieces together is we expose them you know, to audio tapes and things of all kinds of languages. Just, you know, they don't have to understand what's on them. They just have to hear, hear the frequencies. Right. My experience has been any period in which a child has fluid in the middle ear, auditory development stops. All right, and that means not only the ability to process tones stops, language development tends to stop. All right, and we have a huge global developmental problem. Matter of fact, it's such a huge problem. The children who come to us labeled as simply having a developmental delay 
Christine, you get labeled as having a developmental delay. If you take your child to the doctors and they do all the testing they can think of, can't find anything broken, but your six-year-old acts like he's three. Okay. Then you get the label of being developmentally delayed. Virtually every child I have ever seen with that label, if we looked, we found we had problems with those ears. Okay. To put that also in further perspective, in, in treating Down syndrome children, because of the position of their ears and their station tubes, it is the number one with a close second problem in terms of their development and language function. The number one cause of the fluid is uh, sadly dairy products. Um, and in fact, I have a, <clears throat> a friend who was an ENT, <clears throat> and after a number of years, I finally talked him into pulling kids off dairy products who had chronic congestion and, and ear problems. And 75% of the kids never had a problem again. Yeah. That's pretty significant. So number one, I look at dairy products. If the fluid is there and you just, you know, changing diet, you can't get rid of it, it generally means tubes. And often the kids need the tubes in there, you know, for, for an extended period of time. And the process of putting the tubes in is, is a pretty easy deal. But you do not want to keep fluid in there. You know, and, and to give you even the bigger picture there, the fluid is in the middle ear, and the pressure from the inner ear, from the middle ear, puts pressure on the inner ear. Your inner ear is your vestibular system, your balance mechanism. So often the kids with these fluid problems, we not only have delay in their auditory language development, we have delays in their motor development because their balance is knocked off. And to make it even a little worse, you know, relative to your child, the, the vestibular system helps direct the ocular muscles. So often with fluid problems, we see strabismus problems. <clears throat> and typically what you want to do is go to an ENT, your nose and throat doctor, and get a tympanogram done. Simple test, and I'll tell you if there's fluid. And generally when we have families start on programs, if we have questions about fluid, we ask the family to get a baseline of tests, which means we have them go in like every two weeks for two months to see if those ears are clear. Yes, ma'am. Does a child that passes a hearing test perfectly, would they still have, I mean, is it still possible that they could have fluid in their ears? Six or eight frequencies out of 20,000. Absolutely. So a, a, a basic hearing test versus a tympanogram is a total, they're totally different things. Totally different things. A tympanogram test for fluid, hearing test, as I say, tests six, six to eight frequencies out of 20,000. Wow. Sir? What range of ages is this affecting children I mean, or, or adults? I mean, where, what, how broad is that range? Typically, by the time kids are, are six to eight, <clears throat> we've had enough physical growth that we don't see the problem a lot. Essentially, what happens is at, at birth, the eustachian tubes are almost horizontal. And, and as the child grows, they become more vertical and they get larger from the growth so that the fluid drains better. Yeah. So. You know, it's generally at its worst from from birth up until you know five or six, but it can it can continue, you know, whenever. And generally, if your child's congested, there's fluid in the middle ear. So, so if, if if the fluid was there and they're ten or twelve years old now, then is the remedial work you do at that point? Yep. <clears throat> and actually, the it used to, when, I, when I first started in this work and became aware of these auditory issues, uh, it was horrendous because we knew we had a problem, but we had no tools to fix it. And fortunately, in the, you know, the last 15 years, there's been the development of various forms of, of auditory training that retrain the, the brain to process sound. We now use something called the listening program, which is a home-based 
uh, program to re re-educate the brain to process the sound, and it's a it's a very painless process. The kid essentially listens to treated music for 15 minutes a day, and works works well. Yeah. So you do, I mean, you know, as I say, auditory issues. You know, and you'll see more as we continue through the through the evening. You know, are hugely important. All right, and something. If we've got the problem, we need to identify it and and we need to fix it. Yeah. Uh, and relative to hearing, we have number one auditory tonal processing problems. Can we hear the tones? All right. If we have a problem with that, we use primarily the listening program. And a very few kids, we have a problem with the brain processing the tones fast enough, which means the child will hear the first part of a word and not be able to process that tone to process the next tone rapidly enough. There's a program called Fast Forward that addresses that, um, but that's a, that's a rare problem. That's, you know, one in a thousand kids with auditory problems maybe has, has that issue. 